Okay, this month we are continuing our discussion of the asynchronous I.O., ASIO, or ASIO, however you want to say it, library in Boost that provides networking. And last month we looked at how to do basic TCP IP connections uh, with SSL and how to do a uh, NNTP, the beginnings of an NNTP protocol implementation, how to upgrade the connection to SSL in the middle. In other words, establish a plain text socket connection and then upgrade that to SSL. And that's all fine, but really what most people want to do these days is some kind of interaction with uh, HTTP. Either they have an external server that they need to interact with through a REST API or they've got their existing application that they want to add a REST API to it. We've looked at in previous months, uh, I think it was last year, we did a series of presentations on how to do a REST API with various libraries. Uh, the one that kind of came away, uh, ones that kind of came away as the winner were both uh, uh, RESTBED and POCO were good uh, networking libraries. POCO, we looked at how to do an NNTP server, so you can compare that with what we did in Boost ASIO last month. And with RESTBED, which is a library specifically for creating REST APIs, you can compare what we did there with what we're going to do this month. So uh, we're going to look at Boost Beast which is relatively recent addition to Boost and the two main features that uh, Boost Beast provides on top of raw TCP IP networking is understanding the HTTP protocol and uh, implementing the WebSocket protocol. We'll discuss how WebSocket is kind of layered on top of HTTP uh, in the chat, Todd says, I've been using OAT++. It's been working well. Any opinion on that? I have no opinion on that since I've never heard of it. Uh, we'll maybe take a look at it and do a presentation on that later. So um, Boost Beast sits on top of Boost ASIO. And as I discussed last month, uh, or maybe two months ago, with ASIO, there's different flavors of ASIO. There's the one that's the proposed networking technical specification for the standard. There's the ASIO that is divorced from Boost. And then there's the version that is inside Boost itself. And Boost.Beast depends specifically on the flavor of ASIO that is in Boost. So if you're going to use Beast, you have to use Boost, if that makes sense. Now, uh, in HTTP, it's, there are some elements of HTTP that are similar to NNTP, which we discussed last month, and SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. The interaction consists of a message, and the message is separated into a header and a body. And the header is in uh, clear text. It's not binary. The header is separated from the body by a blank line and every line in the header consists of a of, of a series of the header consists of a series of fields each field is consisting of a name and a value and the name and the value are separated by a colon and all the lines in the header and the blank line separating the header and the body end with a carriage return line feed and it must be those two characters. It can't be just a carriage return. It can't be just a line feed. It has to be a carriage return line feed combination. So if you're implementing this stuff raw yourself, you got to make sure that you get that right or you won't be conforming to the specification. And when you receive a request from a client, so HTTP what's, is, called, is what is called a half duplex protocol. The server does nothing until it receives a request from the client. Then the server processes the request, figures out how to respond to the request, and sends a response. And while the server is doing all of that, 
the client is basically blocked waiting for the response from the server and once the response has been sent uh, the simplest interaction between the client and the server is for the server to drop the socket connection after the request has been satisfied now if you investigate the low-level details of TCP IP you might understand that this is not the best way to utilize a socket because uh, sockets have what's called a slow start um, and this is slow start is when you start communicating over a socket initially the rate at which bytes are being sent is intentionally made slow so that if there's congestion on the network you won't make the problem worse by just trying to jam a whole bunch of data into the network all at once so TCP IP stock sockets all start with this they all have this slow start feature it's a it's a fundamental property of the TCP protocol and so the bytes start coming out slow and then if there's no congestion the implementation of TCP increases the rate at which it sends bytes so you can imagine if there's a, a new socket created for every little image and every little piece of JavaScript and every little um, piece of uh, CSS style sheets and whatever other things that are referenced by a web page that results in a lot of socket connections each one having slow start and it seriously impacts the performance of how fast a web page can load so in HTTP 1.1 they added a field to the header called the connection field and this connection field can say to keep the connection alive so after you satisfy my initial request send me the data but don't close the socket and I'll issue more requests to the same server on that existing open connection and by doing that you get you still have to deal with slow start once you start talking to a server but typically when you load a web page from a server all the images and other things that is referenced but the CSS JavaScript files whatever that are referenced by a web page that need to be loaded by a browser those are typically on the same server so you pay once for the slow start but then all the rest of the data starts coming faster until you're basically transmitting uh, or receive transmitting and receiving at the maximum rate between the client and the server so HTTP half duplex uh, operate it has the ability to keep the connection alive so you can get multiple requests coming uh, on the on the sent to the server over the same socket and the response is coming back but the, it's always send a request wait for the response send a request wait for the response the even though sockets can be uh, it, it's sockets are a full duplex connection so you can be writing and reading on a socket simultaneously they're separate receive and transmit buffers but even though that's the case for a TCP IP socket it's not the case for the HTTP protocol the um, server will not be uh, reading the next request until it's finished sending the data for the previous request web sockets change the nature of the interaction between the server and the client and that they upgrade the connection to a full duplex connection and anybody can send a message at any time they don't have to wait for the other side to send a request in order for them to send a message as a response so if you imagine a chat server implemented on a web page without web sockets the client code the JavaScript running in the web browser on the client it has to continuously pull the server to see if there's new chat messages for it to display and that results in a lot of network traffic that isn't an effective use of the network because we're, we're pulling instead of getting a notification so with web sockets once you establish a web socket connection between a client and a server it's a full duplex connection and either side can send a message at any time that also means that either side needs to be prepared to receive a message at any time so it's a little bit different uh, than HTTP but if we're going to do a REST API we're typically going to do that with HTTP if we're going to do something like um, 
push notifications, then you're going to do that with a WebSocket connection. So a push notification is where the server has some updated information and it wants to broadcast it to interested subscribers. And that means that the subscriber doesn't yet know that it should request information like a polling model. And instead, the server is just going to proactively send that information out as a as a broadcast. Now, there's still the connection still has to be established between the client and the server. Uh, a WebSocket, uh, the WebSocket protocol assumes an established connection. It can't initiate a connection from a server to a client. Uh, the the connection is still initiated from the client side. Okay, so uh, we've looked at. Uh, REST API stuff before. Let's look at it again here. Let's go over to our client. And hide that guy. Okay, so um, now if you've ever messed around with uh, cryptography and SSL and, and certificates and stuff like that, it can be a bit of a you know, dance to get the certificates to match up between the client and the server. Um, it's always been that the case that for uh, SSL to work properly, you have to have any, any kind of secure connection, really, not just SSL. But for, for SSL to work properly, there has to be an established web, so-called web of trust between the client and the server. And that's done by managing certificates, and the certificates are issued by a central authority, and the central authority is what assures you that the uh, how how do we say this that the entity to which the certificate has been issued is who they say they are, and if that entity starts you know acting up and doing you know deplorable things, then their certificate gets revoked. Um, and so that's how the web of trust works. Now, in these examples that I've taken from uh, the Boost ASIO documentation, or the Beast documentation more specifically, um, some of them are doing SSL negotiation, and they have uh, what's called self-signed certificates or you know, generated certificates that are just generated for that specific app. And I think what's going on is that not all of the examples are using the same certificate so sometimes when the server and the client try to talk to each other over SSL they give up saying I can't uh, negotiate a proper uh, certificate between the two things I, I didn't have time to figure out um, why that was the case why sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't so um, this example I've pulled it out of the AS or out of the Beast documentation. I've modified it slightly to support my little comic book database uh, API. And this uh, if def use SSL is I, for some reason I could get SSL to work on the server, which I will show you. But for some reason I couldn't get this client as written to talk directly to the server using SSL. So I've added this if def use SSL here and the client's actually going to talk over just plain HTTP and not HTTPS. Other than the SSL negotiation, the code's all the same, pretty much. Um, there's just some very minor differences, but I just want to point that out in case you're saying, hey, I looked at that sample in the documentation and they didn't have that if def use SSL in there, but that's, that's why. Okay, so let's kind of drill top down. So I've got uh, this client. It takes a host and a port and a HTTP version. Um, the host is just the address of wherever the server is running. The port is whatever port that server is listening to. HTTP version, you know, it's either 1.0 or 1.1. 1 1.1 is the default. Uh, 1.0 is the version of HTTP that does not have the um, ability to keep the connection alive. And we're going to run our little client here. So um, just as we've done before with 
Boost ASIO, we're going to establish an IO context that will be, let me make this a little bigger. The IO context will be the thing that dispatches um, either bytes read or bytes written or a timer event having gone off. It'll dispatch that notification to an appropriate handler that will process the um, the event basically um, and if you're doing you know Unix style programming that's typically a select on a socket a set of file descriptors if it's a select based mechanism there's other kernel based mechanisms to get a process woken up when something happens um, boost ASIO handles all those variations it'll pick the best one if you want it to use a specific strategy you can force it to do that uh, here's our SSL context. Uh, we're going to load some certificates into it, set up some uh, verification parameters. Uh, this is my global state. It's just a little structure that contains a reference to my database that I'm going to be serving up with my REST API. The uh, boost ASIO uh, con IO context, the SSL context, uh, the HTTP version that was specified on the command line, and this little uh, uh, vector of IDs here is just um, so we can see how the data that I've received from the server in the client uh, is uh, used to dump out some state at the end. So we're going to do a couple get requests on these different resource URIs. So this is uh, just a, you know, in my little, I have haven't shown my comic book database for a while just to show you what that looks like we just have basic create read update delete operations on this thing and it's really just a vector of of these structures that you know have some fields in it that describe an issue of a comic book so I'm going to request a couple resources and I'm going to establish an HTTP session for each request and I'm going to queue up a an asynchronous operation to request those resources and insert them into a local empty comic book database that I have here in my client I'm going to satisfy all the IO requests until there's no more pending requests and then once I'm done I'm gonna just dump out the uh, the for each ID that I fetched I'm gonna dump out JSON form of that data that I fetched from the from the server now um, in the beast samples he does something a little bit different than what I did uh, with my NNTP server last month so whenever you're doing asynchronous IO requests, you always have to pay attention to the lifetime of the objects that are processing the requests and any state that they're keeping around in order to uh, handle that processing. So the uh, idiom that is being used in the Beast documentation, now it, this is not a requirement of Beast, it's just the way that the author of Beast decided to write their examples. So I just want to make that clear. There's nothing in Beast that requires this. It's just an idiom they decided to use to manage the lifetime. So they, whenever they're going to do asynchronous operations, they make a shared pointer of a class that will perform the operation, and the operations will be, you know, represented as methods on the class. In order, the handle the event handlers will be represented as methods on the class. They make a shared pointer, and then the object that implements the request handling derives from an uh, enable shared from this so if you're familiar with uh, std shared pointer there's a control block that contains the reference count and then there's the block of memory that represents the object that's being counted that that's held for which there's a held a counted reference so when the reference count goes to zero then the allocated object is destroyed now, when you do, uh, w when you have a class that derives from enable, let's make sure I say it correctly, 
let's enable shared from this yes enable shared from this this gives you the ability to call a function called shared from this that normally when you have a shared pointer you're newing a, a chunk of memory on the heap and then you have a reference pointing to that block of memory that's managed by the rep by the reference count however if you're wanting to if you're inside a class that is referenced by a shared pointer how do you return a um, pointer a, a shared pointer that references the this pointer from inside and that's what shared from this does is it this this will return a shared pointer for this instance of this session class and it will be if we go back here it's the same shared pointer that's being ma managed by std make shared so it's not a dis you have that problem with shared pointers that if you have two shared pointers that have two distinct reference counts pointing to the same block of memory that's bad because one of them's going to free it first and then the other one will be holding a reference count on a block of memory that has already been freed so y you need to make sure when you're using shared pointers that you're always sharing the reference count for everybody that has a shared pointer to a block of memory so we're all sharing the same reference count so we're all coordinated when the reference count goes to zero none of us are holding a reference when the memory is freed so enable shared from this lets you create a proper shared pointer from inside the class to pass to other functions and so the idiom that they're doing is they make a shared pointer to an instance of some class they call uh, a method on that class inside inside that class it's going to initiate asynchronous operations those asynchronous operations are going to be tied back to the same instance of the class by using a, the the bind front handler as a way of binding a instance method to a shared pointer of that that points to this instance and that will create the completion handler for this asynchronous operation so that when the asynchronous operation completes this object will still be alive because we generated a shared pointer from this so that guarantees the lifetime is extended until the completion handler runs and then when the completion handler runs if it doesn't queue any more asynchronous operations that will decrement the reference count on the shared pointer and if that's the last reference count meaning there's no more pending asynchronous operations on this class then the class instance will be deleted so if you haven't seen that idiom before it, it might be a little confusing but that that's it's basically a way to extend the lifetime of these classes so that the class is always alive as long as there's another pending asynchronous operation that's going to call back into a method on the class the way I did it in uh, last month for my server was a little bit different. I managed the lifetime of the class that was processing the asynchronous operations by just having it in a variable that was in the scope of my main function. And instead of using a bind front handler and shared pointer from this, I was just using a lambda to capture the this pointer in my completion handlers and I was so uh, all the uh, completion handlers were tied back to my class instance through the binding of the lambda but um, the lifetime of my class was fixed because it was static with respect to the invocation from my main function which is fine for a server but when we are initiating connections dynamically to clients and maybe to different servers we're initiating connections to different servers from inside the client you kind of want the session the, the all the state for managing that connection you want that to come and go dynamically as needed and in a web browser you're going to be browsing too many different servers uh, so you, you, you don't want to kind of have to manage that state explicitly so the uh, shared from this and uh, make shared uh, idiom can be useful okay so now that we got through all that.
when we get into this, uh, we saw that here that they were making a session, calling run on the session object, and uh, except for this little SSL junk, which will just collapse, um, we're going to, so this is the client code that we're looking at here. So we're going to create an HTTP request. He's got it held in a member variable here. This request class, it, it's parameterized on this body type. I said that every request in HTTP and every response consists of a header and a body. When we're doing a GET request, you can put a body in a GET request, but it, it's typically ignored by a server. I don't know what they would do with it. Um, because a GET request does not involve any transmission of data from the client to the server. It's from the other direction. That's why it's called GET. So the HTTP request here is specified as having an empty body. And we're going to fill out various fields in the request. Now, in Boost Beast, the you you can get at the fields directly if you want to but typically you just manipulate the fields in the request or in the response by calling methods on the request or the response object so here we're setting the http version uh, in http the there is the method and in uh, if, if you think of a traditional database application where you've got so-called crud operations create read update delete those correspond to the different HTTP verbs and uh, you know it's it's sometimes it's called the verb sometimes it's called the method it, de it depends on which part of the documentation for HTTP you're reading but we're going to do a get request the target is the path to the resource in our case we're accessing a REST API so where it's the path to the resource that we're going to access uh, the host field is set to uh, not the host we are communicating from, but the host we are talking to. Uh, user agent, it's that's a nice to have field. Um, and I just added this little logging in here that I'm requesting, you know, a comic resource at this particular path. And the first thing we have to do, as we did last month with NNTP, whenever you uh, are establishing a connection to a server out on the internet, the first thing you need to do is go resolve the host name and the service to figure out its IP address and the number of the service. You notice here the service is a character string. So this could be either a string of digits representing a numerical port or it can be the name of a service like HTTP for which there is so-called well-known ports. Uh, the well-known port for HTTP is port 80. Eight zero. So the first thing we're going to do is resolve the host and the service and now we're going to get into a chain of asynchronous operations that we initiate by calling the initiator function which in this case is the async resolve function on this resolver and we saw the resolver last month it's how you access the domain name system to turn host names into IP addresses uh, or to resolve service names and we're going to then invoke this uh, callback on resolve and we're going to keep ourselves alive by using shared from this and bind all that together using bind front handler uh, so this little pattern will be repeated as we do all these operations as an asynchronous initiator with some extra arguments and then the completion handler will be specified by this binding a call to this binding function with the address of our member function and a shared from this. So once we resolve, just as we saw last month, you get either an error code that tells you whether it worked or not, and then you get resolve or results. So now we have a list of IP addresses associated with uh, that name, typically if it's a host name. Uh, and now we're gonna try to connect to them in order. So this version of async connect takes the result list, the whole list, and it will try the results from the resolver. It will try to connect to them one after another in order until they all fail or one of them succeeds. And that will take us to on connect. Uh, 
So now we've connected to one of the uh, IP addresses. Um, this, if we were doing SSL, this would be the point where we would upgrade the connection to SSL by doing the, the, the SSL handshake. Um, uh, otherwise, we're just going to do, we're, we're, otherwise we skip the handshake and go straight to writing our request out to the server. Uh, if we were going to do the handshake, if the handshake was successful, the next thing we would do would be to write the request to the server. So we just kind of skip that intermediate handshake, handshake callback if we're just doing plain client connection. We, uh, the, the good behavior for a networking application is to set a timeout on operations that you perform. And here, uh, they're setting the timeout, you know, using the, the TCP IP timeout mechanism. And the reason there's this get lowest layer here is because the way SSL and WebSocket connections are represented, it's represented as a layered model of streams. So given that TCP IP timeout mechanism is in the lowest layer, uh, the, the bottom layer of this stack of wrapped streams. That's why there's the uh, get lowest layer expires after you know 30 seconds here. It's just setting a timeout for this asynchronous operation. So we're going to write to the stream the request that we built. And when that completes, we will call the on write handler. And uh, again, we will um, always check error codes. And after we've written the request to the server, we will read the response from the server by doing an asynchronous read. And when that completes, we will call on read. And now finally, we've, we've gotten out of the networking and now we're into the application portion here. So what I've done is I've made a HTTP GET request to a resource that represents a uh, record in this comic book database it came back as JSON I didn't actually validate that the content type came back here in the response was JSON I just assumed it was JSON uh, I'm, if I wanted to be more robust I would put some kind of uh, check here before this try to validate that the expected content type was JSON that I came that came back from the server because I'm gonna take the body of the response I'm gonna pass that it's a that's a string I'm gonna pass it to this uh, from JSON uh, put up from JSON function uh, question in the chat is the content type header so in HTTP there uh, the, the requests and the response come back as a header and a body and there are certain fields that are specified by the HTTP protocol specification that will be mandatory in the header there are other fields in the header that will be optional and there can be arbitrary application specific fields in the header you can communicate any kind of data you want in the header it's kind of a free form name value pair of, of uh, it's like a dictionary essentially so the uh, in this case uh, when we look at the server we'll see that I set the content type to application JSON that's what will come back in the response I didn't validate that in my client code here. That was slight oversight. Uh, I'm just going to assume it's JSON. Turn that into a comic structure from my little database function. And I'm going to take that record, reconstitute it from JSON, and insert it into my database. This is my local database now that I'm holding on the client. And um, do a little bit of logging. And then I'm going to remember the ID of this uh, record that I created here. Again, we that little vector of IDs that was what that's being used for. Now, whenever you're doing this asynchronous I/O code, it's always important to remember what happens when exceptions get thrown. In my case, uh, this create comic function or this from JSON function, they could both throw exceptions. So I am 
uh, I've got a try catch wrapped around my application processing catching the exception uh, I'm logging it here but continuing on because I need to do I, I need to continue doing my asynchronous processing um, now if we were doing uh, SSL I would close the stream here and maybe that's a mistake maybe we should be closing the stream all the time it doesn't really do anything anyway it just uh, I think this async shutdown is only for the SSL case uh, I'd have to double check that anyway as you can see it's very similar to what we are doing with NNTP only this time with Beast we don't have to manage the details of parsing the message headers and the message bodies and uh, validating the contents of those messages and we don't have to um, worry about you know how to process the field names which you know the, technically the standard says that they the names of the fields are only uh, case insensitive so when you are looking for headers you have to technically do a case insensitive compare I've, in practice I've never seen a web server return like content type in all lowercase but that's legal according to the specification they could do that so boost beast is going to handle all that message processing of what constitutes an HTTP message but either a request or a response and uh, otherwise, it's very similar to what we we're doing with NNTP. We have to resolve host names into IP addresses. We have to establish a connection. We have on the on the client side, we have to establish a connection, and then once that connection is established, we have to do read and write operations. The server is very similar. Now, I, I got the server to work just fine with uh, HTTPS, so there's no like if def craziness going on here. Um, let's go over here. The server is very similar. I'm parsing some arguments and passing them on to this little run function. If you, if you uh, look at my code for this HTTP server and client, it, it, it's adapted from the code in Boost Beast, but it, it's not identical because I've, I've thrown in the resource support for these uh, comic book database records. So I'm going to run the, the main loop of the server. I am creating my comic book database. It's not empty. I've loaded it with some data. Uh, then I'm doing the same SSL uh, IP address uh, uh, stuff. And uh, this is my server state. Uh, and then there's this make shared idiom again this time because we're on the server we're going to use uh, what's called in, in socket terminology it's called listening for a connection so we have a listener that's going to run and really when we call that run function all it's doing is queuing up asynchronous IO operations because remember asynchronous operations return immediately to the caller and then at some later time when the IO operation is satisfied the completion handler for that operation will be invoked so this just queues up work it doesn't actually do anything yet the first bit of work it's going to do is going to be to set up listening on the address and port combination now this code here from boost beast when we discussed uh, multi-threading for ASIO before we talked about how um, one way to get multi-threaded IO to complete is to run a number of threads so here we have a vector of std thread and then for each of those threads we're going to have those threads share the IO context so all the threads are using the same IO context and each thread is going to call IO context dot run and that means that when work is pending on this single shared IO context it could be picked up by any one of these worker threads and executed so when we are uh, processing the response to these asynchronous operations 
in this example, because we're using a, a thread pool to process the completion handlers, we have to make sure that any work that we're doing is thread safe. And to be honest, I think I, uh, I only implemented get. I didn't implement any modifying operations here. If I was going to do that, I would need uh, mutexes. We saw this before when we talked about implementing a REST API using RESTbed and other libraries. So nothing new there. Just want to point that out that because it's multi-threaded processing, if you once you get to doing any kind of I/O operation or thing like that, you have to make sure that you're pro doing things in a thread-safe manner. Now, it you you may be thinking, do I need to put mutexes around the uh, the the boost or boost beast or boost ASIO? objects that are being manipulated in the completion handlers and the the answer is generally no if they're distinct um, objects so in this case we're creating one listener um, and the listener if we look at it uh, it's got the shared so it's got this shared state, which contains a shared reference to the database that would need to be locked. The shared I.O. context, um, I think that's, you don't need to uh, arbitrate, you know, with a, with a shared uh, or overriding with a mutual exclusion lock around that because what you're doing is adding to um, the, the internal queues. I think that's fine. And the SSL context is only used in a couple of places. Um, so when we um, get into our listener on this run, on the server side, so on the client side, we did a connect. On the server side, you do accept, which means that you're going to accept connections from clients. So there's this uh, acceptor object, which we looked at uh, before. Well, we talked about it last month. I implemented an NNTP client. I didn't implement a server. This is from the server side. You accept connections asynchronously. Uh, and because the connections can be accepted from any thread, he's using the make strand function on the IO context to ensure that things are basically serialized through the IO context. So Connections can be accepted on multiple threads, but once you um, uh, queue a next operation, the next asynchronous operation, it's queued in such a way that um, they won't be executing concurrently, if that makes sense. The, the completion handlers won't be executing concurrently. The I.O. will be taking place concurrently, but when the completion handlers inv are invoked, they'll be invoked on the strand associated with the I.O. context, and so they'll they'll essentially be uh, serialized in that way so that you don't get uh, a contention for state. So once we um, get a client connection coming in, the completion handler for that is on accept. Again, always checking error codes. And the next thing we're going to do is um, this code I've adapted from the so-called flexible HTTP server. So this server will accept a connection either via HTTP or HTTPS. So what it's going to do is uh, when a connection is established, the first thing it's going to do is try to detect the SSL handshake. That's the very first thing that's communicated on a socket when the socket is initiated via SSL. What we saw last month was upgrading a connection in the middle from plain text to SSL, we did this uh, SSL handshake in response to uh, negotiating that upgrade with the server. Here we're just assuming it uh, that that it might it might be present um, and we're going to do that by calling this async detect SSL and that's going to tell us when it invokes our completion handler, it's going to give us a boolean that tells us whether or not the connection has the SSL handshake on it or whether it's something else. So if it is SSL, 
we're going to make an SSL connection, sorry, an SSL session, and we've already read some data into a buffer. Now, when we read data asynchronously, there's no guarantee that we read only the data that consists of the SSL handshake. We may have read additional data after the handshake. So we're transferring ownership of the buffer that we read into in order to perform the handshake detection. So that buffer was passed up here when we called async detect SSL. So we're transferring ownership of that buffer to the SSL session so that as it goes on to whatever its next asynchronous operation is, which is going to be reading the HTTP request. We may have gotten a few bytes of the initial part of the request after the SSL handshake into that buffer. So we need to hand that buffer off to the underlying uh, SSL session. Uh, and we're also handing off the uh, socket associated with the stream. So we're handing, we've detected the SSL handshake, we've consumed the bytes that represent the handshake, and we're handing the rest off to the SSL session. If it wasn't SSL, then we haven't consumed any bytes out of this buffer yet, and we're going to pass the whole buffer and the underlying uh, socket on the stream to the plane session. Um, the plane, uh, let's get, I guess we'll look at the SSL session first. Uh, this is the constructor, and we, when we handed it off, we called, we did the this you know make shared idiom, and then we called the run method on the SSL session. The first thing the SSL session does is um, it is, as I say here, they're using the strand to. Uh, make sure that we're um, not it's to make to make sure that the multiple threads that are uh, processing these connections are coordinated in, with the uh, asynchronous I/O framework. So that's <coughs> what dispatch does it is dispatching onto the executor associated with the stream and. Uh, here we're, he's using a lambda instead of the bind mechanism. Um, but the first thing that's going to happen on, so we when we did the detection up here, when we said async detect SSL, that just detected if the handshake was present. Once we have detected that, we need to actually do the handshake. So that's the first thing an SSL, the SSL session does is it performs the handshake and then when the handshake completes uh, we can consume the bytes that represented the, the handshake that's communicated here and this bytes used. We can uh, gobble them up out of the buffer and then we're going to do a read operation. So Again, setting a timeout, and then we're going to do an async read to read the request. Once the request has been read, we'll come inside here, and we're going to, uh, when, sorry, let me back up a little bit. When we do the uh, async read, we're doing HTTP async read. When we looked at reading bytes before, it was doing just plain boost ASIO async read that's just reading raw bytes. Here we're doing the async read of the request into an HTTP request object. This time we're saying that the request object has a, a string body instead of an empty body. So instead of it reading just into a bag of bytes which we then have to parse we're reading it in, uh, it, it gets read into a buffer, but it's also being, that buffer is parsed into a request structure. So when we get into the completion handler for on read here, we have a complete request structure that's already been parsed out into a valid HTTP request.
so we don't have to worry about parsing the, <clears throat> the name value pairs, separating the header from the body, reading the body. That's all been done. We have a complete message in terms of an HTTP request. And uh, that is just passed over to a little global function here. Now, it's, it's a template function because these request objects are template classes uh, that are al uh, parameterized rather by uh, the body, the type of the body and the allocator used to allocate the body. Um, in my case, I just used a uh, simple using uh, using type alias, I guess is what they call it, a type alias up here, that it's HTTP request parameterized by the body type. The header is basic fields parameterized by this allocator type. So in my handle request, I'm just going to look at the method on the request to see what kind of uh, verb it was. If it was a get, I'm going to, you know, delegate to the get handler. Now in my, if I were to implement my full REST API here, like I've done when we talked about implementing REST APIs with other libraries, I would do the full set of create, read, update, delete operations. This time I just did the, the read operation in the get. These other uh, methods, they're just stubbed out to return bad request, not implemented. But for a get, now the uh, these little helper functions that are processing the request, they're, they've got a reference to the database and they're going to return what's called this message generator and um, in, in our case that is this response so our response is an HTTP response with a string body we're going to again inside a uh, try catch block when we call any application logic we're going to get the ID number out of the path that was associated with this request, read it out of the database, create a, a response object, set some fields on the response object. The body of the response will be JSON representation of the record we read out of our database, and we will return that uh, return that HTTP response. Now up here, I'm just doing a regex match on the passed in path to validate that it was appropriate for my REST API. When we looked at higher level libraries for making REST APIs, we saw that they had a so-called router that let you specify patterns. And, uh, you know, those patterns often looked like something like this text here in the comment that they would automatically analyze the incoming target path against the set of uh, registered patterns and then it would route the appropriate request to the appropriate object for handling that request. We don't have anything that fancy in Beast. We just have an understanding of HTTP requests and responses. So we have to do this ourselves. Now if we were doing many resources this would get cumbersome so if we had a lot of different resource types and a lot of uh, embedded parameters into our paths here it probably would be better to either make our own middleware that that did that routing from paths to uh, handlers handler objects or maybe use a different library like restbed that has that already built in but if you're already using Boost ASIO and you just need to add a few little uh, REST API endpoints, this isn't so bad. So uh, here's where I set the content type of the response to application JSON. Um, I'm using these predefined field names here. Uh, he's just got an enum. These are all predefined fields for the protocol. But as I said, the, the header is an arbitrary bag of name value pairs. You can put any arbitrary field in there that you want. Uh, and that's certainly possible with Beast. I'm, I'm not doing it here, but you could. Um, the keep alive, we mentioned that uh, 
you know, with HTTP 1.1, you can keep the connection alive and have subsequent requests come in on the same connection without having to get a new socket every time. We're just passing on whatever keep alive indication came in on the request. We're just passing that on in the response. Uh, the body, we're just setting it here as uh, this string because our response is HTTP response with a string body. This prepare payload, now in the HTTP protocol, it is required that the responses contain a content length header field that says that specifies the exact um, byte length of the response. Um, there is also for, for responses that you're generating dynamically where the total number of bytes isn't known up front. There's also so-called chunked encoding where you specify that the response will come in chunks and each chunk specifies the size of the chunk. And the reason that is done is so that the client can uh, get an idea of how much memory it needs to handle the response by examining, uh, to, 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 and it gets an idea of how much memory it needs to handle the body by examining the header. In the case of the so-called chunked encoding, it looks at the header and sees that there's gonna be one or more chunks uh, in the body and each chunk will give it an idea of how much memory it needs to process that chunk in an arbitrarily large response. Um, this prepare payload, because we're building this response here ourselves by one piece at a time, the prepare payload, what it does is you call this after you've set the body, and then it'll prepare the content length uh, header value for you so you don't have to compute it yourself. So it's kind of a little bit of a, a a small convenience there. So we'll return that response and then handle gets return value will come from handle will be propagated on through handle request. Handle request gives its value to send response. So that was just build uh, all that code we just talked about in handle request. That was all just to build the response object. We haven't actually communicated anything yet. That's when we get down here where we are doing an async write operation. We're gonna, this business of calling derived stream, this is curiously a recurring template pattern. This is a base session class that's shared by the plain session and the SSL session. So this is this derived stream business is making sure that we are using the specific type of stream for the derived class, which in the SSL session will be an SSL stream. In the plain text uh, session, it would just be a plain TCP stream. And this is due to the layered stream model that's in ASIO and in Boost. Oh, sorry, in Beast. Uh, we're gonna, the message here, which we got back from handle request, that's the thing we're going to use as the source of data for the asynchronous write operation. And uh, when that operation completes, we'll call this on write handler. And notice here, we're doing derived shared from this. This, if you've looked at curiously recurring template pattern before, it's always, you have a template class. It takes as the template argument, the name of the more derived class and inside the base class, which is what we're looking at, you can access the type of the derived class by taking your this pointer and ca casting it to a reference to derived. So that's what this little helper guy is doing. So what we're over here, we're getting the shared pointer to the derived class, not a shared pointer to the base. And in fact, the, uh, the, this base class, it does not derive from enable shared from this. It's the derived classes that do that. So that's why we have to call derived shared from this to keep this object alive while the asynchronous IO operation is pending. So after we write the data back, we've written the response back, now basically we're done. If we're not keeping this uh, connection alive, we can just 
close the whole socket. But if we are keeping the connection alive, then we need to read, go back and wait to read more data to find the next request. So that's what the server looks like. Now let's get, uh, that was like a lot of talking. So let's go and see what this looks like. We will, what I'm going to do is, okay, I'm going to run the server in the debugger. And when you're testing REST APIs, there's handy little tools out there like this one. This one's called Advanced REST Client. It used to be a little uh, extension for Chrome. Now it's a it's its own desktop application. This is what we're going to use to to look at things. Let's run the server. Okay, so the server says we're listening for connections on endpoint localhost address loopback address. So here I am going. I'm using that address and that port to to create a. HTTPS GET request in in this little uh, exploratory client here. You can change which HTTP HTTP verb you want to use. Uh, I've when we did REST APIs before, I showed an earlier version of this tool. It's gotten fancier. It's now a desktop application. But we can send this request, and the response came back. Okay, uh, was, we were already looking at that one in this window. So let's change it to ID zero. And you can see that this issue number changed and some of these credit fields changed. This is the JSON that came back from the server. If we look at the headers, the response headers, that we can see that the content type was set to application JSON, that prepare payload set this content length field. Uh, the server was set to this boost.b slash three forty five. If we look in here, it's that's came from this predefined is this a pound defined? Yeah, it's a pound defined constant. Um, and there was, uh, if we wanted to look at the raw body, this is what the raw body looked like. It was smart enough. This this client knows that if the applic if it's application JSON meme type, that it can pretty print the JSON for us. Now, if we send it uh, some ID that's not in the database, we get back internal server error response code and the body of the message sorry the body of the response is just basically human readable text that says you know it's an invalid ID 456 now when we talked about rest API's before I implemented the other verbs so that I could create new records in this database and read them back I didn't bother to do that this time it just be a repeat of what we did before what we're looking at uh, this time oops I should run that again because I didn't show you plain HTTP. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay, so that was HTTP, oops, HTTPS, right? Fetch record zero over HTTPS. That's executing the code in the SSL session object. But if I switch it over here to just HTTP plain text, that also works. Just to show that both the plain session and the SSL session both worked and we were able to properly identify when the SSL handshake was present and then do the handshake and then upgrade the connection to SSL when we were talking. Now. For that, that's that's basic HTTP, right? Sending a request, getting a response. For WebSockets, it's a little different. Um, let's look at the server side. Okay, so for again, this is cribbed from this is this one is exactly the uh, WebSocket sample. I confess that I tried to take my existing HTTP slash HTTPS server that we just looked at and I tried to extend it by adding web WebSocket functionality. What I was hoping to do was to add a WebSocket path that when you connect to that path 
it would upgrade the connection to WebSocket protocol, and then as records were added to the comic book database, it would send you a notification that new records were added. However, I I just frankly couldn't get that to work in time. I was working on it this afternoon and I got close, but I couldn't get it quite to work. Um, so this is the stock WebSocket client and server example. Um, we're going to talk about what's different from what we just looked at. So this all all this part here, uh, you know, with the listener is very much the same. We get into the listener. The listener is going to do an accept. It's going to accept connections, and then when a connection comes in, it's going to establish a session and have the session start running. The session is going to <coughs> do a little dispatch to make sure that things are thread safe. They dispatch through the IO context executor to make sure things are thread safe. We're going to then do the SSL handshake. So this is all the same as before. Then once we um, get in here now, this time, instead of operating on a TCP stream, this is a WebSocket stream. So I mentioned that uh, the stream model in ASIO is layered. So here, the bottom layer of this cake, if you will, is a TCP stream. That is wrapped by an SSL stream. So an SSL stream knows how to do the uh, SSL handshake, and it knows how to do the encryption and decryption and manage the keys and all that stuff. And once you get through the SSL processing, you got a, a raw byte stream. But on top of that is the WebSocket stream. And that's because once we've upgraded our connection to use a WebSocket protocol, the WebSocket protocol exchanges messages as um, a series of frames and each frame can contain arbitrary binary data so the frame has a header that says how many bytes are in that frame and uh, one or more frames make up a message in uh, WebSocket the messages can be either text or they can be binary and if it's a text message then the the frames constitute a UTF-8 payload and when the frames, when the payload is divided into multiple frames, there's no guarantee that it's going to be split on a UTF code point boundary, a UTF-8 code point boundary. So a UTF-8 code point is one or more bytes. There's no guarantee that the frames are going to be split on a code point boundary. The, the frames are generally uh, just a way to take a large message and chop them up into chunks and send them off as individual chunks. So messages are made up from frames. Frames have a length and a payload and the messages are either a text message where the payload represents a UTF-8 sequence of bytes or it's a binary payload where the bytes are just an arbitrary uh, arbitrary blob of data there's also a, a ping, a pong, and a close message a, uh, one side can send a ping and in response the other side is supposed to send a pong and this is just kind of a way to, if you have a connection that's open for a long time and you haven't talked on it for a while, the state of the network could have changed in the meantime and, and you, you don't know it because you haven't tried to transmit anything. So typically, if you have long-running WebSocket connections, the client might be sending pings periodically, like once a minute, once every five minutes or something like that, just to see if the connection is still live, make sure the network is still functioning between the two endpoints that represent the client and the server. So WebSocket streams understand frames and they understand messages and depending on how you interact with the stream you can either interact in whole message chunks or you can interact in frames and you might want to interact in frames if you're doing something like sending streaming video data over a WebSocket you're going to say keep you're going to you don't want to accumulate the whole streaming video content in memory as one giant message and then have the WebSocket carve it up into frames. You might want to send pieces um, of the video data as you go instead of having to accumulate that into one giant buffer. So, back here to this code. <coughs>
when we are doing TCP IP timeouts, we're accessing the lowest layer of this stack of streams and using the TCP IP timeout of saying, you know, timeout after 30 seconds. Now WebSockets has its own um, timeout mechanism and we'll see that when, when we switch over to that. So uh, we're going to do the SSL asynchronous handshake. That is a method call on the SSL stream object which we obtained from the WebSocket stream by calling next layer. So this SSL handshake is operating on the result of next layer which it, it's a template class so it, it maybe if I hover over it it'll tell me it just says next layer type but because of the way this variable is declared the type of the next layer is the SSL stream oops a little too far okay so we're gonna do the async handshake on the SSL stream and when that completes We know we've um, got a, a functioning SSL stream. Now we're going to uh, do the um, WebSocket negotiation. Because remember, when you, it, when you make a WebSocket request into a uh, web server, it, it starts out as an HTTP request that is upgraded to a WebSocket request. So this is kind of similar to what we saw with the NNTP server last month where in the NNTP protocol there's a start TLS command that we used to upgrade the connection from a plain text connection to an SSL connection in the middle. There's a very similar thing that happens here with WebSocket. Uh, so we're going to set some WebSocket options. We're on the server so we're setting it the option that says we are in the server role and then here they're doing a, a set option um, using a, what's called a decorator. So I said that the WebSocket connection is negotiated as an upgraded HTTP connection or HTTP request. When the HTTP response goes back to the client, you use a decorator so that you can modify the header of the response before it is written back out to the client. So that's what's happening here is that this decorator is going to receive the response and it's going to set the server field to this uh, what we saw before this you know boost slash beast you know 345 whatever and it's going to add on there this WebSocket server async SSL. That's additional data that tells the client we're doing um, it's a web socket it's it's asynchronous SSL I, th I think this is purely um, you know for debugging human readable purposes I don't think this text is uh, part of the protocol specification but I'm not 100% sure about that I haven't read this the specification myself okay so now we've done the SSL handshake now we have to do the WebSocket handshake. The WebSocket handshake does specify some additional um, binary data that's specified in the headers of the request coming from the client. There's there's some uh, negotiation that goes on there. Um, so we call async accept on the WebSocket stream to get that additional WebSocket negotiation performed, and. <coughs> If that was successful, then we can go in here and do a read. Now, at, at this, once we get to here, everything has been boilerplate up until this point. Once we get to this point where we're reading a message, it's like really, uh, WebSock is designed for like these long-lived, you know, conversations with you know spontaneous notifications coming from either side. This server is simplistic in that. It does one read, reads the results uh, of uh, reading a message off of the WebSocket connection, and then it does one write, 
and then it goes back to do another read on the server side. So it, it's reading a message, echoing that message back out to the client. So let's just trace through it here. It, we've done the uh, WebSocket negotiation. We're going to do a read. So we're going to do asynchronous read on the, the WebSocket connection. When that completes, when this completes, because we said uh, async read on the WebSocket stream, that means we've read an entire message, not just one frame or however many frames make up the message, but we've read the whole message. If we knew that we were going to get potentially large payloads coming from the client, like they were uploading a video, we probably wouldn't do async read. We would do async read sum or maybe even operate on the nested SSL stream inside the WebSocket stream. But I just want to point that out, that this is being simplistic here. It's reading an entire message. And then when we get that message, we're just going to uh, echo it back out. It, this, uh, this is the, the text setter on the WebSocket stream is being called with the value from the text getter on the WebSocket stream. So that's saying if the incoming message was text, then the outgoing message is text. If the incoming message was binary, then the outgoing message is binary. Because we're just copying the data that we read from the client back out to the client. So it's just acting like an echo server. Again, doing an asynchronous write operation on the WebSocket stream. And when that write operation completes, we'll just gobble up whatever was in the buffer. We don't need that anymore. Uh, this essentially clears the buffer, right? Saying so whatever, gobble up as many characters are, as are in the buffer. And then go back and do another read. So it's this, the server kind of runs forever doing read a message and then write that message back out to the client. The client... Now... I said that WebSocket requests are HTTP requests, which is true, but you may have noticed nowhere in here did we look at the path of the incoming request that got upgraded to a WebSocket connection. If we were to do that, we would do it. So here's the SSL handshake. And then we're getting ready to um, upgrade this request to a WebSocket, or upgrade this connection to a WebSocket connection. If we wanted to validate that WebSocket connections could only be made on certain paths requested from our web server, this is where we would do it. Before we upgrade the connection to WebSocket protocol, we would validate the request that came in. Uh, Yes, because the SSL handshake happens before we've read the request header. Um, this async accept is kind of hiding the reading of the request header from the client. It kind of does everything. It, it looks at the request and examines it for um, the WebSocket handshake fields that should be present in the header. So if we wanted to have some requests go to our regular REST API, some requests go to serving up files, and some requests going to a WebSocket uh, conversation, we need to break this operation out. Um, and there's a function for doing that, that in, in the uh, WebSocket name space is a function called uh, is upgrade I believe let's just double check that real quick we'll go over here to the reference go down here to WebSocket yes this function called is upgrade it takes a request and that's how you would I segregate out normal HTTP requests from an HTTP request for a path that's supposed to be upgraded to a WebSocket connection because you may need, and, and that's what I was trying to do with my uh, code that I couldn't quite get to work in time, is I was trying to have it 
serve up the normal REST API on those endpoints that we saw like slash comic slash ID and then on a different and uh, a different uh, URL path slash updates is where I was going to have the uh, WebSocket connection and I was able to uh, have it you know negotiate all that do the is upgrade test and, and negotiate the uh, WebSocket upgrade but um, I couldn't quite manage the state correctly and it was getting hung up there so if I figure that out I will push it up to github but it wasn't ready in time for us to talk about it here tonight but it's looking at the client side everything's all similar but reflected from the other side and you see here I'm just gonna skip down to the point where we are we've done the SSL handshake and now we're doing the WebSocket handshake and here is where the path associated with the incoming HTTP request is specified in the client. They're just specifying slash. On the server side, it wasn't even looking at the, it wasn't differentiating. So any, any, any request to any path was going to get turned into a WebSocket uh, or upgraded to a WebSocket connection. Here, we're spe you know, this client code is specifying slash. And this client code uh, just does one it, it unlike the server code which runs in a loop forever the client code does one exchange it sends some text to the server and then after that text has been written to the server it does a read from the server it reads back from the server that text and then it prints out the text that was read back right before it closes the connection. So if we go over here, if I run the server, uh, with a number of threads, one, th one thread, uh, if I run that server, and then I set the client as my startup project and run it here. It wrote this text. You didn't see it. I passed it as command line argument. I said connect to localhost port 6000. That's what I ran the server at. And I said send the text hello world. You know, I could say hello Utah C plus programmers. Okay, and then run this again. And now it's echoed back, hello, Utah C++ programmer. So that is the essence of uh, WebSocket. The, the important thing to know is that just like we did with SSL last month, that you upgrade the connection after uh, the HTTP after the H connection to the HTTP server is made, you use uh, special fields in the header of your request to request that the connection be upgraded to a WebSocket connection. So that upgrades it from a half duplex protocol to a full duplex protocol. And the response back from the server tells the client whether or not that upgrade took place. And the WebSockets class in Beast is how you get access to that. You've got uh, message processing in WebSockets and in just plain HTTP for handling complete messages, or you can handle pieces of messages if you're streaming multimedia data. That's handling pieces of messages is going to be what you want to do. It's all pretty straightforward. The documentation is good. I would say the documentation for Beast is better than if I can get up here. Here we go. I would say the documentation for Beast is better than the documentation for the basic uh, Boost ASIO. A and I think that's just due to um, them being written by different people. You know, so it's not, it's not the same author. It's not, uh, it's not like the two authors didn't talk to each other. <coughs> 
but you know coming from a different person the the documentation has a different feel to it um, there is plenty of examples um, also something that's interesting in beast is that the documentation kind of has a refresher around networking and some of these uh, concepts like buffers and timeouts uh, layered streams composed operations those are all things that we talked about when we talked about ASIO um, but the, I think the explanations here are a little better in in beast and we didn't talk about rate limiting but if you've ever used any uh, commercial rest API you might see things like you know there's a, f a free level that l gives you a certain number of requests every month or something like that it, it's it, it's just simply a matter of bookkeeping right associating every request back to a customer that's typically done by having a custom header field that specifies some kind of you know opaque blob of data that represents your key your access to the API and if you don't supply that key then the API request is just rejected outright um, these are the kinds of things you have to do when you have a public API public rest API to make sure that people aren't abusing your server maybe just because they're mean or because they're too cheap to pay for the resources that they're consuming when I say they're mean I mean they might be doing like a denial of service attack or something like that on your server um, so with rate limiting the idea is to uh, either terminate the handling of API requests or slow down the rate at which you respond to API requests because they're making too many requests too quickly um, the examples given here in the documentation uh, revolve around the the data rate so how many bytes per second you're, they're going to allow you to read or write through the socket um, so that's kind of useful to, to look at or, or to know about it, you know if you need if you need to access that functionality it's good to have an example of that in there um, there's also inside here there's some things that are just kind of general useful tools that you could use them from the beast library in conjunction with boost ASIO there's some buffer types uh, there's some other um, kind of just what's the right way to say it? it it is realization of the concepts that are described by boost ASIO uh, in terms of con realizing those concepts as a concrete type that has a specific policy so one of the problems I found with looking at boost ASIO is that a lot of the reference documentation is constantly referring to abstract concepts as opposed to specific classes and it's a little bit easy to get lost in the documentation kind of trying to figure out what does this all exactly mean what is it what what kind of classes am I supposed to be using instead of uh, referencing everything by their concept name and I found the beast documentation was a little better in that response in that regard rather that it, it was more readily accessible because it talked more in terms of concrete types with example code rather than abstract concepts whose realization as concrete types are only described in the reference so the discussion here uh, I thought was better um, I will be uploading this code to, to github uh, so you can take a look at it there if you want um, overall I'd say if you have to do some custom uh, accessing of a small number of resources from your C++ code and you're already using boost ASIO this is a good fit for that use case if you have to implement a large API surface for a rest API and you're not already using boost ASIO in other words it's the first time you're adding a network uh, access to these resources in your application I, honestly I would recommend using something like restbed uh, instead because restbed is more specifically targeting the needs of a rest API whereas uh, if you just need to fetch a couple resources by HTTP some binary blob or something like that or you need to upload some data to a web server via HTTP you need to do a post operation certainly beast is, is fine for that um, if you don't need
the fancier features like access to the chunked encoding or access to individual frames in a WebSocket conversation, Boost Beast is going to be easy to use because it has those facilities for dealing at the, the message layer rather than at the individual chunks. But if you need to get access to those chunks, like you know, streaming multimedia, it's a common use case these days, uh, it's not difficult to access those lower layers, but it's also convenient to use the higher layers. So if you don't need to do tons of HTTP or WebSocket processing from your application, I would say Beast is a good fit. If you have a large API surface that you need to expose via REST, then I would recommend looking at RESTbed or possibly another library. Um, and other than my own difficulties, I don't, I don't think my difficulties of trying to get the WebSocket code integrated into my REST web server, I don't think that was Beast's fault. That was just I didn't allow enough time for me to figure that out. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get it figured out in time. Okay, so that wraps things up. Uh, if there's any questions, you can either go by audio or in the chat. Otherwise, we will wrap this up, and we'll see you next month. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, so stop there.